Philippians chapter 1, we'll continue on as we get there. And this week I want to talk about striving together. And again, this whole chapter 1 has just been a whole bunch about the gospel and getting it out and nothing stopping it. And the devil trying to stop it, and, but it's used for the furtherance of the gospel. I got put in jail. It's for the furtherance of the gospel. Remember we talked about, about how that, uh, most of us, if we got locked up in jail, would just like Paul, I can't start churches now. I can't do that. And we think we're limited, but he said it happened in the furtherance of the gospel. God is using us to get the gospel in more places. And, and uh, the devil gets outsmarted by God. When we, when we accept what God's let happen to us, but when God is doing something, he's doing an end around on the devil, like with Joseph or like with Paul in prison or whatever the situation is, and you begin to murmur and complain and be angry or whatever that happens to you, you, you kind of undo God's secret plan there. It's like when your, your kid goes to you and, uh, you know, you've you're, you're got a big surprise to your wife and your kid goes, Mommy, Dad's got flowers and he's around the corner. I mean, that's, uh, that's what it's like when you mess up God's plans when you aren't thankful and don't trust the Lord when bad things happen, when all those things happen. And uh, so let's uh, look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 26. It says, uh, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in, in Jesus Christ for me by the coming to you again. Only let your conversation be as become of the gospel of Christ, that whenever I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit and one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which to them is an evident token of perdition, but to you is uh, of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now hear it to, uh, to be in me do. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for the chance to teach, and thank you for the Bible. Thank you, Philippians, the great book, just the the uh, encouraging, happy New Testament book of Paul in the New Testament, Lord. This church was uh, was bragged on so much by you, Father. Maybe we should learn some things from it, and I pray today we would. I pray you'd speak in a great way and uh, do great things in our midst, Father. We just, uh, I, I don't want to say anything you don't want me to say. I want to say exactly what you want and want to see the power of the Holy Spirit move in each one of our lives because we need that, and you need us to be right, to be effective for you and to bring you the glory you deserve. So I pray that you'd help and speak and uh, just take control of uh, this uh, service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul finished up uh, early, uh, where we were last week. He says, I'm going to straight betwixt two. He says, I want to be with Christ, which is far better. Um, but uh, to be with you is more needful. And what a, what a thing to say. Paul, of course, had seen into heaven a little bit and kind of seen what it was. And... and uh, and, uh, and, and really kind of understood what was going to happen and his rewards. And he said, I'd like to be with Christ. His body was, I'm sure, hurting. I'm sure he's tired. I'm sure a whole bunch of things with all Paul had been through. But he said, I, I wanted to, I wanted to, I want to go with Christ. But he says, I'm kind of stuck because in between two things, because I need to be with you, which is, which is really important because I think you need me. And I kind of finished up last week as be needed, be needed. And, uh, and, 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 and he says, because I'm going to, when I come to you, I'm going to help you. And uh, I, I, I just talk about the importance of that. And I, I think how few Christians, it's a sad thing, it's a sad statement, but how few Christians, if they died, would it actually affect the cause of Christ? Or would things just go on? And Paul said, I, I need to stay because you guys need me here. And, uh, and uh, you know, if you died, would, uh, you know, the cause of Christ be able to continue the same way? Uh, you know, I think some people think that, you know, well, I, I tell people when they do something wrong. Well, <laughs> that's not helping anybody. I mean, if you're, you're an encourager, if you know, if you, if you need, I, I, you know what, I, I, sh I, you know, I'm there. Okay, there is good. But Paul had to be there. Paul, God said, I can't take you to heaven yet. I need you too bad down there. <laughs> and Paul said, in the end, he says, I know I'm going to end up staying because you guys need me. And because there's other people and other churches that, that need to get going and things. And so I think that's just a powerful thing there. And because it's all about the cause of Christ. If you just follow, you look at uh, verse 12, for the things that happened, happened rather for the furtherance of the gospel. 
We look at uh, verse uh, 17. I'm set for the defense of the gospel. Um, verse 18, he says, uh, Christ is preached, and therein I rejoice and do rejoice. And, and you just kind of see that Paul's mind is on the gospel um, and uh, getting it out and, and the soul winning mentality. And understand that being a soul winner and after souls and soul winning, it's a mentality. Um, something switches in certain Christians when they get a hold of it. And now, uh, they aren't just like, you know, the Great Commission's something needs to be done. It becomes a mentality where they see souls. <laughs> they don't just see people. They don't just see individuals. Jesus is seeing the multitudes and moved compassion. And you begin to see the needs, and you begin to see the gospel. And maybe when you fly in from the airport, instead of looking at the layout of the city, you start thinking, Lord, there's a lot of souls down there. How are we going to reach them? You just kind of get after souls. It's, you, you say, I need to go to church because there might be somebody there I can encourage, and somebody um, there I can, I can uh, help get saved, and I, I need to be praying for more laborers. And you, just, you just get it's It's a mindset. Being after souls is a mindset. One of the great soul-winning pastors in, in American history, um, he had, he had um, for 23 years straight, he had a convert baptized every Sunday. And he called it getting bit with a bug. He says, but look, when they get bit by the bug of soul winning, he says, they're just different Christians. When they get after souls, they're just different. And uh, Paul was just like that and thinking about that. And, uh, and he knew he was going to stay um, and uh, do some more work for God. And uh, we go back to verse 26. He rejoiced me to be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you. You're going you're gonna to rejoice more in the Lord and, and, and do more for God in the end, he says, uh, verse 24, 25, 26. But he says, first of all, let your conversation or your behavior be fit for the gospel of Christ. Verse 27, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. The word becometh means appropriate. Conversation in the Bible means behavior, okay? Let your conversation <clears throat> be as becometh the gospel. Part of it is what we would call conversation. The words change a lot. What you'd call conversation be part of it, what we, we say, our words, that's part of it. But your whole lifestyle, let it be that which becomes the gospel of Christ. And there's that, the gospel of Christ again. You want... Uh, I, I, my, our pastor used to say this. He used to say, um, separation is the glove that goes around soul winning the hand. And, and, and he started explaining that you find out that when you become a soul winner, when you become after souls and you become a witness in your community, you find out that your lifestyle changes. Because you don't know until you start witnessing how closely people are watching you, nor how much what you do affects the unsaved. Uh, I, and uh, I knew a lady, she, she, was, she was a Christian for, oh, 25 years. And she came to our church, and she went out witnessing with my wife. First time she went witnessing, the first thing she just kept on saying is, because they had three different people, said, you know, I, I, I thought about that stuff. But, you know, my uncle said he's a Christian, and he did this and this and this. Other person says, yeah, these neighbors over there say they're Christians. They do this and this and this. And then another person, they said, you know, I, I've really been thinking about God now. I have some friends who really got transformed and, and really are different when they started going to church. And she came back. She was just stunned. She says, I did not know the world is watching us this closely. And it's affecting their decisions so deeply. But once you begin to be after souls, you start understanding that your lifestyle matters. What people see in you matters. And it, it literally will affect whether some people will get saved. Once you start talking, you better start walking. <laughs> and and uh, once you start talking, you better start walking. Uh, look, when I drive the church van, I always think twice before I cut somebody off. <laughs> I mean, I got I to gotta either not cut them off or I got to get the name off the back of the van. And, uh, but, uh, you know, because why? Because... Look, it, it, you, you represent the cause of Christ, and, and, and you, you, people, people know who you are. And you'd be surprised how much they watch. They want to see if what you have is real. They want to see if it's all just a game to you. They see, they've seen so many hypocrites. They say, but when they see a real Christian, it impacts them deeply. But they see so many that aren't. Let your conversation, let your lifestyle, your behavior fit the gospel of Christ. Let it be appropriate. Let me just illustrate this here a little bit. Um, I've got some clothing here. 
in the bag. And uh, let's just try some things here. All right, what do we got here? Does this fit? So the, all the rednecks say, yeah, man, it looks great. <laughs> and uh, and uh, this, this, this outfit go together? Not really. No, it doesn't really. If I, if I walk in the pulpit, the visitor would look at me and say, does he know that hat doesn't match? Actually, kind of a little bit of kind of a red maroon, maybe. I don't know. How about this? I got hats from all the world. Does it match? Is it appropriate? If I just preach the rest of my sermon like this, someone sees it online, they're gonna look, they're gonna click and zoom in and say, "What's going on there?" Maybe it'll work. Maybe I'll, I'll get some extra clicks and people will listen to sermons. I don't know. Does this fit? Is this appropriate? Okay. Let's see what else you got in here. How about how about this one? I didn't. Somebody's gonna take a picture right now. Is this appropriate if I preach rest of a sermon like this? How about if I look tough? <laughs> I preach this sermon. Does, does, does this, is this appropriate? I'm in Seattle. <laughs> I mean, but is this appropriate? It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't go together, does it? It doesn't quite, that, that one of these things not like the other one? And, and it doesn't quite fit? What if I, uh, oh, let's see, what else we got in here? Let's try this. Let's go like this. And let's see what we got here. Uh, how's this look? All right. Not bad. I don't know. It doesn't quite fit with the tie, actually, really, and the, and the, the slack. I don't know. <laughs> Some things just don't quite fit together. What if I put the tie out? <laughs> and the pink cat. How about this? <laughs> now I look like people who see a Fred Meyer. <laughs> and, uh, no, I need I need pajamas and slippers and, uh, and, uh, and then, then I look at people at Fred Meyer to, to come in there. Is this is this appropriate? No. Is this become is this becoming? <laughs> Somebody saying I don't see anything wrong with any of that. No, we need to talk to you about that, okay? But do you see how some things don't fit together? They don't, they don't, that doesn't match that. And, uh, and we, we see that some things don't fit together. I don't know, maybe I do this. And all you can see is this part of me, and I put the tie down. Then I start matching again. But really, I got to undo this. This is going to be wrong. Some of you are in pain. <laughs> some of you fashion people are in pain right now looking at this. And so, and, uh, and so we look at all this. And we say, you know, that doesn't quite fit. If I came up here and preach in my pajamas today, <laughs> some of you might say, yeah, that's kind of cool. And, uh, <clears throat> and you say, but, but you might say, yeah, you're behind the pole, but maybe, maybe not the pajamas. Maybe that. It just doesn't fit. It's not appropriate. Okay. And the Bible says, let your, let your life live in such a way that it becomes, it it's appropriate attire. It, it looks right on the gospel. Because you're representing the Lord Jesus Christ. And your life, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And you want to make sure that you match. You match. Your lifestyle matches. My wife told me recently, she says, honey, do you know that didn't, didn't match? And I said, yeah, I knew that. And, uh, but, uh, uh, and I, was, I was actually wearing some clothes one last time before I sent them off to the thrift store. And I thought, let's just throw them on and I'll get one more use out of them because I'm cheap. And, uh, but, uh, but, you know, sometimes your, your lifestyle doesn't match what you've been saying. And it's supposed to match. And it should become the gospel of Christ, it says. Let your, only let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ. She says, look, I, I'm going to hear about what's going on there. And if I'm not there or I'm there, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I'm there or not. You need to match the gospel in your lifestyle. Only let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ. Or whether I come and see you 
or else be absent. I may hear of your affairs, that ye may stand fast in one spirit. He says, look, whether I'm watching you or not, live it out. It, it, it's not a church thing. <laughs> you, don't, you don't just live right and read your Bible when you're at church and, and live like a Christian. It's, it's the gospel. It's, it's, all the, it's your whole lifestyle. And, and Paul says, look, whether I'm with there or not, you need to live this stuff. And, and one of the important thing to remember is you got to live the gospel whether the pe- preacher is watching you or not. If you're a Christian. God's always watching you. Amen? So live in such a way as becometh the gospel of Christ. Work in such a way that becomes the gospel of Christ. Talk in such a way. Tell jokes in such a way. Um, uh, 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 decorate your house in such a way. Uh, treat your family in such a way as becomes the gospel of Christ. Do business in such a way. And it becomes the gospel of Christ. Look, the, the person gives you extra money in the cash register. They messed up. You, you, you do the appropriate thing and you, you give it back. It just it fits the gospel. Honesty and purity and above ground and, uh, and all those things. I should say drive, but I'm going to offend a bunch of you. Drive as such becometh the gospel of Christ. And, uh, but uh, but uh, do things that make it look like, you know, when you're, when you're screaming and yelling at the guy next to you at the stoplight, you know, what are you doing, you stupid idiot? And you pass him, and you got Jesus loves me on your back bumper, you know. Well, yeah, might not be good, uh, you know. And, and just, just live a lifestyle. It backs it up. Number one, let your conversation be as be, uh, fits the gospel of Christ. Number two, have one mind striving together for the gospel. Uh, verse 27, it says, uh, uh, it says, the end of the verse says, uh, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. One mind striving together. This is really important, really emphasized here in Philippians. We don't know. It's a good church. We don't know if maybe there's a couple different mindsets because it kind of emphasized strongly to have one mind in the church. And, of course, that's a good Bible thing. Um, but chapter 2 and, and look, at, look, at, look at the emphasis in verse 2. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded and they having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. <laughs> Boy, he just said having the same mind, having one mind in verse 27. In verse 2, it says be like-minded. And then in the verse, he says one mind. And then it says the same love of one accord, of one mind. Four times in one verse, another time in another verse, he's saying, be of one mind, of the same mind, one accord. That's, of course, we see in Acts chapter 2. Uh, you see Pentecost happening after in Acts chapter 1. It says they were, in, they were uh, praying with one accord. And then Acts 2, 1, it says they're all with one accord in one place. One accord means of one mindset. And, and they, they had the same mindset. Um, and... Uh, I understood this much better as a pastor than I maybe understood this, this Bible concept just uh, uh, being a, uh, in, the, in the church all those years. Um, uh, I don't, uh, you, when you have 10 different mindsets or five different mindsets in anything, in the family, in your business, whatever, when you got different mindsets, you become so inefficient because you're pulling different directions. <laughs> You know, and, 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 and if one person's kind of pulling this way, even they're kind of going the same direction, it can work, you know, but, but if you're, you're just kind of, you're going to end up farther and farther apart. And, and I want to say one of the hardest things to do as a leader is when you have to drag people up the hill. When we're not going up the hill together and, and you have to pull people because they're trying to go back down the hill, it'll exhaust you. And, and one mindset... I've, I, I decided a long time ago, when I, when I started understanding this, and when we got just, when we started the church, we got just some transfers from different churches and different mindsets, and they, they wanted to, uh, they just had different agendas, and not bad people, just different agendas, and they wanted to do different things, and, and, and I started realizing, man, they, they, they just don't believe in, you know, the vision of winning the world to Christ, and missions, and the things we do, that's not their priority, their, their priorities, whatever, and and, and, and I, didn't, I, I never thought they were my enemies. That I just realized how important it is to have one mind as a church. This is where we're going. This is what we're doing. And we all pull together the same direction. Look, if you got a, the strongest guys in the world in a tug of war and they're pulling different directions, it's not gonna, you're not going to win. 
and, and have one mind as a church and, and to, 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 to get behind the vision and the word of God and say, let's do this thing, as opposed to people just everybody wanting to do their own thing and everybody, uh, everybody wanting to just go their own direction. Look, one mind of one accord is a biblical concept. And I think each church gets a little bit different vision. They're all about the cause of Christ and, and souls and glorifying God and, the, and you know, the, the priorities of the Bible, the discipleship and whatever. But one has a little more of this and one has a little more of that. But a local church should be of one mind. This is where we're going. This is what we're doing. And, uh, and we should all just uh, uh, strive to, to not have our own personal agenda. And by the way, I shouldn't have my own personal agenda. It's the cause of Christ. It's the will of God. And what's the vision of God for this church? It's his church. And, 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 he, and, and when we, we get that mindset, just pulled together. Everything's never exactly like you'd like it. Okay, but I've said a lot of times that um, 100% of 50%, you have to do some math here, but 100% of 50% is less than 100% of 90%. So let's pretend like you, you find a, a, a church and, uh, and you're only 50% behind, or it's, you only good 50% of it. Look, find a church you agree with more than that. Okay? And, and understand, if you, if you go and you agree with 90% of a church and you get behind, a, and, and, and you get behind it 100%, you got 90% of what you want to see happening. Okay? But if you're only 50% behind... 100% church, <laughs> you're not getting anywhere, okay? The, the, understand, find, uh, be of one mind. Don't have little personal strifes and little agendas and, and little things. D just, just don't be petty and, and about little things and what color the carpet is. And, and, and churches split over that stuff, okay? And, 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 uh, and, and don't be about little, if one of the funny things a pastor is everybody in the church who has a job thinks their job is the most important, which is exactly what I want. But understand, we have to balance everything. We have to, we have to balance keeping the vehicles running with the PA system and everything's important. But, we, but a lot of churches, for example, um, the musicians push and push and push and push so much for the music to be everything. Pretty soon the music takes over the church. Where it's an important part of the church, but the musician doesn't care at all about the evangelism. As a pastor, I got to make sure everything important is done. That's why pastors usually balance people. They're they're kind of uh, uh, they're not A pluses in anything. They're Bs in everything, and or Cs in my case. But but we we're, we're, everything's important because we all got to keep together. We all got to keep together, and and understand that. Get behind when you do something for the cause of Christ. Get behind it, and throw yourself in. And don't 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 let your you know your 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 little agenda. Or my little agenda, take us different directions if it's not about solid Bible doctrine. Solid Bible doctrine, okay? And, and, and don't get little personal squirmishes and little, you know, uh, everything. Really decide. And, and before you decide if something, and, and sometimes a church is going the wrong direction, I get that. Really be able to show with the Bible why that's important. If you, if you have a problem. Not, well, you know what? I just remember my church I grew up in had brown carpet. <laughs> okay, that's nice. I got saved in a brown carpet. We need brown carpet. Okay, that's fine. But, you know, we all got to be just one mind. What's important? The Gospels is what's, is what's important. Have one mind striving together, it says, for the faith of the gospel. How do you get that one mindset? It's very simple. You have the same end goal. If, if we all got to go out that door right there, then we're all going to be going the same direction. Okay? And understand the, 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 the faith of the gospel, the doctrine of the gospel, and the getting out of the gospel is God's agenda. And that's what we should be after. That's what we should be after. And, and caring about the cause of Christ and the souls and, and things like that. It's so important. It's for the faith of the gospel. Verse, we see verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 27, of one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. We see uh, in verse 12, we said, I would you understand, brethren, the, the things that happen 
and may have, have rather fallen out to the furtherance of the gospel. That's what he's all about. The furtherance of the gospel. And it's about souls. And it's about reaching people. And it's about getting uh, more people. The Great Commission. Save, baptize, disciple. Get, uh, get people saved, baptize, disciple. And it's important. Number three. Don't be afraid to suffer for the Lord. Verse 28. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries. That's an amazing statement. Which to them is an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation of God. For everything we read and just get little hints, it's not said directly. But it looks like the Philippian, the Philippian believers were persecuted, and they were per- persecuted financially. You just see um, little blips here and there. It's, it's in the book of Philippians. You see it in the book of Acts. You see it in the book of 1 Corinthians, that they became very poor after they got saved. Okay, and and uh, and that was common in the New Testament. They wouldn't hire the Christians, and uh, and they would be outcasts of society and things. And uh, and he, he he talks about here just being willing to suffer for the Lord. He says, "Don't be terrified by your adversaries, which to them is an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation." What's that saying there? It says, first of all, when you're not afraid, to them they think it's because you're dead and you don't care and because you're weird. He says, you're lost, even when the Jews are persecuting them especially. He says, it's because you're lost and, and you don't know what you're doing. But he says, do you understand that the persecution is coming because you're living godly? All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If they hated me, they'll hate you also. It's a sign we're saved when the unsaved hate us. <laughs> and he says, it's a sign of salvation. That, look, if, the, if, the, if they hated me, Jesus says, I'll hate you also. Marvel not, my brethren, that the world hates you. All that live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And understand that we should be standing in such a way that we, the world, doesn't like it. You know, and, and we aren't doing it because we're offensive. We're kind. We're compassionate. However, the gospel is a rock of offense. One way to heaven is offensive. Jesus is the way. The truth and life is offensive. Right and wrong and, and sin and righteousness is offensive. And when you preach the word of God, it's going to be offense, offensive. And, and w- when you stand today and you say homosexuality is a sin, it's still an abomination, it's offensive. But the, the, the bunch of Christians are running from it because they're going to have people offended at them. Look, it's normal to be hated by the unsaved. Be, be, uh, we, you can love them like Jesus. You can forgive them. You can do whatever you want. They still crucified Jesus, and he didn't do anything wrong. All he did is heal them and fix people and, and, and feed people. But, but, you know, if they hate me, they'll hate you also. Don't be afraid to suffer for the Lord. Verse 29 is important. For unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict which you see in me, all the persecution I go through, and now here to be in me. He says, look, it's given to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Jesus, it's given to you to suffer for his sake. It's been something that's given to you as a Christian. It's part of the deal. It's in the contract. You have to suffer for him. <clears throat> now, we live in a tolerant society. We live in a, a society with fantastic laws protecting us. And so you are probably, they can't fire you because you're a Christian. It's just not legal, okay? Um, they, they, we are free to go witnessing, and they can't put us in jail for witnessing. Our laws are great for that. Your suffering might not be beaten and put in jail. It might not be, um, you know, uh, you know a, a matter of them firing you. They, they won't hire you because you're a Christian, okay? But it might be you can't take that job because you need to go to church on Sunday. And you didn't get the quite job quite that you would like to have. It might be you have some friends mock you and make fun of you. It might be you have to homeschool your kids because you can't send them to public school anymore. And you have, to pay for, you have to pay for your education. You have to take the time to educate your kids. Because, look, you understand that public schools are indoctrination camps. They're churches. Okay? Uh, and and uh, it, it's, 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 it's really bad. And uh, it, it, the stuff they want to teach kindergartners, they shouldn't teach seniors. Okay? And, and, and that's how we might suffer. 
You might suffer because, you know what, you don't sleep in on Sunday like you'd like to. But please, this is my, this is my alleyway here. Please don't whine because of your American suffering. They rejoice in the Bible when they are beaten for the cause of Christ. And I, I sometimes just kind of don't know what to say when I hear an American Christian whine because you should go back to church Sunday night or because they have to miss the Super Bowl because it's on Sunday or because, um, you know, they, they, they got a tithe. And that's your suffering as a martyrs up in heaven roll their eyes at you? As the people burn at the stake, as an f- entire family was fed the lions together, huddling together while the lions ate them, and you're saying, this is not fair. I have to read my Bible every day. I have to go to church every Sunday. But I, that's when I go golfing. Yes, that's, that's your suffering. <laughs> and you're embarrassing yourself in the cloud of witnesses in the Lord's eyes. You've been given to suffer for Christ. And, 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 and you know, we, we, we might need to do some building, and, and, and you might need to sacrifice some money. And that's your suffering. And, look, I, I get it. I get it that our suffering is suffering to us. When your cousin says, I'm not going to talk to you anymore, when, you're, when your mom says, you know what, you're a nut, you're an extremist or whatever. I, I get it. It's hard, and I, it's not fun. When you have to now obey your parents because you're a Christian, honor thy father and mother, and you, didn't, you weren't comfortable doing that before, and you didn't do that before, or when you have to give up your smoking or whatever, you got to do. When you, when, you, when, you, when, when you have to do that, I get it suffering to you, okay? Because, look, we got easy lives. But, even though it's suffering, I get it's hard for you. Do not whine about having to suffer for Jesus. No matter what your suffering is. Let's just look at what they did in the book of Acts, Acts 5. I'm going to have to treat that person kindly, even though they're nasty to me. Yep. And, and it's going to be hard. But and unless you're good at perspective, which most people aren't good at perspective, and it sounds terrible, they've been terrible. You know what they've done to me? I know, it's hard. But unless you can get perspective, you're really not going to understand really how good you got it and how small your suffering is. I know I say it all the time, but go to Haiti with me. Like, I watched Christians who carried their chairs because the church had no seats and dirt floor and, and in Haiti dress up for church, the best clothes, and they only have one set of best clothes, and they carry their chairs. I watched them carry them two and a half hours walking to church. And, and an American Christian, well, the bus, the bus doesn't stop right by the church. The bus stops down the street a little bit. <laughs> you just the perspective of uh, bringing life into perspective. You know, I read Fox's Book of Martyrs and and change your perspective a little bit of uh, of suffering. Read Jesus Freaks. This is a newer version of it. Uh, Acts chapter five <coughs> and uh, verse forty. Uh, it says, "And uh, to him they agreed that when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go." And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And they were beaten. <laughs> and all you had to do is give up your pride and say you're sorry, even though you didn't do as much bad as them. And it's not fair. Yeah, but you were 10% wrong, so apologize. Well, they're not going to apologize. I know that's going to be your suffering for the Lord. And be thankful that's all your suffering. Get some perspective. First world problems. <laughs> First world problems. They're not kicking. You're, you're not the Nigerian Christians. Where the Muslims are coming and burning the whole village and killing and taking all the girls away. 
That's not your suffering for Jesus. Okay, amen. Uh, don't be afraid to suffer for the Lord. Uh, Philippians, let's go back there. For it is given unto the, on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but to suffer for his sake. And the crazy thing is, he's going to reward you so much in heaven. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. He's going to reward you so much, you're going to be glad you suffered. Rejoice in that day and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Next. Oh, boy. I remove vain strife. Uh, let's look at uh, chapter 2. If there be any, uh, therefore, this is uh, Philippians 2. If there be any, therefore, any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any f- uh, fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill you my joy that you be like minded, having the same love, of being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other, other better than themselves. Lowliness of mind. Remove vain strife. How do you do that? First of all, uh, love. Verse 2, it says, having the same love. I'm gonna, these points I should elaborate a bunch, but I'm just going to run through them. First of all, love. Love covers a multitude of sin. Love forgives. Love uh, never fails. It, it endures all things. Love people. That will get rid of your vain glory, your vain strife, and, uh, and get rid of that strife you have in your life. Uh, don't do anything uh, 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 don't have vain strife. First of all, you have love. Love just says, okay, I forgive you. No worries. I love you. I know you're struggling. You say, in your mind, you might even say, you know what? This person's struggling in sin, and I love them. I want to be deliverer of them. So I'm, I'm just going to take it all. And love just covers a multitude of sin. Love just bears all things and, and, and have love. Secondly, uh, don't do anything uh, through strife. Uh, let nothing be done through strife. Or vain glory. Strife is you come in to fight. Don't do anything through strife. In everything you do, try to avoid strife. The Bible says in Romans 12, as much as lies within you, live peaceably with all men. Don't do anything through strife. Look, even when I'm overseas and, uh, and doing negotiation, you go to the market and you say, how much is that? And they look at you and you're an American and they say, it's, it's 5,000 pesos. And you're going to go through the whole process. You're going to say, ah, 2,000. And you say, oh, 4,900. And you say, 2,100. And even then, in negotiations, I don't do it with an angry spirit. I don't do it fighting. I just walk away. I always have somebody from the country go back and buy it for me at their price. But I don't want to have strife. Don't do, don't do, don't do anything through strife. In church, don't do, I'm going to march up. The, okay. That you're going to march up to them and tell them is already, you're already wrong. Don't march up and tell them. Don't do anything through strife. Okay? Next, don't do anything th- for, for, uh, through vain glory, verse 3. Let neither be done through strife or vain glory. What is vain glory? It's, 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 it's written as one word, but we can all understand what that is. <clears throat> Uses this. It's when you're, you're going and say, you know what? I'm going to tell them off. And then I can't wait to go tell everybody what I said to them. Vain glory. Vain glory. Where you are trying to get glory that you're something else. Don't do anything to get yourself glory. That's useless glory. Don't do anything. So everybody, I want everybody to look at me. I want everybody to notice me. I want everybody to appreciate me. Don't do anything through vain glory. That's how the church stays of one mind. That's how you remove the strife. Don't do anything. Vain glory literally means self-conceit. <clears throat> self-conceit. Quickly, I'm going to turn you to some verses about this. And uh, Romans 13. And verse 13. I'm going to go quickly. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in riot and drunkenness, not in chamber and in wantonness, not in strife and envying. I've watched out for the vain glory. Verse, uh, verse 13 says there. Um, Galatians 5.26. Again, I'm just going to read these verses quickly. You don't need to turn to them. It says, but uh, let, be not desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. It's not what we're supposed to do. How do you do that? Really, if you look at chapter 2, how do you uh, remove all strife? You have love. You don't do anything through strife. You don't do anything through vain glory. And then you esteem others better than you. Verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, 
let each esteem other better than themselves. Wow. <laughs> Just remember who you are. That'll help you, first of all. Remember who you are. But secondly, understand that person you're talking to is, a, is someone made in the image of God, a precious soul who has great things to do if somebody can deliver them, even if they're messed up. And put them above you and say, your needs are more important than mine. You know what? God will give me grace to handle this loss of this situation and this loss of my pride. God will give me grace to handle it, but I'm not sure that this person can handle it. So, you know, I'm going to put them above me. I'm going to put them above me. Esteem the other better than yourselves. You know, there's nobody I know of who, who, I don't know of anybody who has more, I don't know of anybody's sin that's more than I know of my own sin. Does that make sense? I don't know that much about anybody else. But I know a lot about myself, and I know enough about myself not to, not to strut around. Because <laughs> I don't know anybody who's done more sins that I know of than I. Does that make sense? You don't know all their sins, but you know all your sins or a lot of them. You, know, you should know enough to keep you humble. Right? Okay, at least me. And, uh, and uh, so, um, just esteem me better than you. And, uh, but uh, uh, do, do, do that. Next, uh, look on the things of others. Or verse 4. Look not on every man in the things, uh, uh, on his own things, but every man also in the things of others. How to not have vain strife is look on the needs of others. Isn't it a weird thing? Let's say we, we had a, somebody buy a bunch of pizza today, and we're all going to have pizza. Don't, we're not going to. Don't get your hopes up. I just made you, hope deferred makes your heart sick. I just made you all sick. And let's say we had a bunch of pizza out there. And I said, you know what? There's only enough pizza for 25 people, though. Would you say, you know what? I'm not going to make I'm going to make sure that the hungry people get pizza. I already, got, I already had breakfast. Probably some people didn't eat breakfast. Let me make sure they get some. Look not every man in the things of himself, but every man also in the things of others. It's a, don't just say, I'm doing good, so it's a great, everything's great. But look on the things of others. Your needs are met. Are their needs met? Is this person going without and you have? I got one candy bar and I got me and them and they're looking at my candy bar. They're looking at my candy bar. Go buy your own candy bar. Look not every man in the things of himself, but every man also in the things of others. That's a good way to not have strife. How are you doing? Not, I got what I need. Look in the things of others. Look on their needs. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Next, be a servant. Verse 5 through 7, we'll finish up. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. This state of mind about putting others above yourself was Jesus' mindset. That's the mindset we're supposed to have. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of sinful men. Wherefore, because of this, God hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and confess it. He is, uh, he is God. You know what? <laughs> Jesus became the servant to everybody. Oh, you guys haven't eaten? We'll feed the 5,000. You you're blind? Okay, we'll, we'll serve you. Your heart's broken. You're lonely. You're a sinner. You're, let, me, let me help you. <clears throat> Jesus, when they mocked him, he wouldn't even defend himself. <clears throat> he made himself of no reputation. They tore down his name. They lied about him, and he... Didn't say a word. Why? He made himself a no reputation, became a servant to everybody, and he was God in the flesh. And before we get a little haughty and say, you know what? I've done this. I've earned this. They've done this. Just remember Jesus became the servant to the woman possessed with seven devils. He died for the Pharisees. He died for the Roman soldiers who crucified him. He became a servant to everybody. And the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. Put yourself below people. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And he was God. God washed the dirty feet of the disciples. 
That's serving. That's serving. If Jesus can serve and he became a servant, maybe we can need to forget ourselves. And I always worried about being first in line and not, and not looking down so much on people and just become a servant. Lower yourself and, uh, and, and become a servant and, and just bear the burden. And, and look, the good Christian has to bear the brunt of the other person thinking they won. That's okay. Just in lowliness of mind, esteem others better than yourselves. And in heaven, God will equal it all out, and he'll make everything right and reward you in a great way. Be, that's the way we get rid of all this vainglory and strife. It's just to make ourselves like Jesus, who was a servant to all. Amen? Amen. Nice, easy stuff, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, that's how you be like Jesus. That's how you, that's how you don't fight uh, with each other in church and everything. And so basically just give to me and everything and give me what you have and we'll be fine. And, uh, but uh, that's, that's not what we do. We're all after each other and we're serving each other. Amen. Put yourself and be the servant. Don't be afraid to scrub the toilets. And, and don't be afraid to serve somebody else. And don't be afraid. Don't, don't, don't be afraid if you come in second on purpose. Amen. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for the chance to preach your word. I pray, Lord, this is hard for us. It's hard for us to be servants. It's hard for us to, to look into the things of others. It's hard for us to um, be the servant of all. And But, Lord, we've got to get rid of our vain glory. We're, we're something about us. We lift ourselves up. We're proud. And I pray to help us to be humble like Jesus. I pray to help us to have one mind and just strive together because the cause of Christ is so important. And people are so important. I pray to help us to do these things and to follow your word in Jesus' name. Amen.